no two evaders faced exactly the same challenges or dealt with them in the same ways. But Ralph Patton's experience had much in common with the experiences of other successful evaders. This is his story. I'm Ralph Patton, and I was studying for an accounting exam on December the 7th, 1941, when the Japs hit Pearl Harbor. So I threw away my books and got quit school and enlisted in the United States Air Force as a flying cadet, we called them in those days. And I was actually called to active duty in August of 42, and I graduated from flying school at Aldous, Oklahoma in May of 1943. I ended up as a co-pilot in the B-17 and went overseas in October of 1943, where I was assigned as co-pilot on a Crew 38 in the 94th Bomb Group, the 331st Squadron, stationed at Bury St. Edmunds in, in the southeastern England. On our ninth flying mission, we were bombing an airfield over near Bordeaux in southern France when we were hit by flak over the target. So we came off the target, lagging behind the formation, and she came up over the Bay of Biscay, and we were about two miles behind the formation when they crossed to the southern coast of the Brest Peninsula in France. So we made a 90 degree left to try to get away from the anti-aircraft fire and the fighters hit us at the same time and the entire tail assembly of the B-17 broke off at the tail wheel retracting well. We, I immediately climbed out of the co-pilot seat. My parachute was under the seat. I snapped it on the harness, dove head first out the escape hatch door, which the uh, engineer and the, uh, or the, the navigator and the bombardier had open, and I dove out head first and spinning like a top, decided that I should watch to see if the ground was coming up before I pulled the cord. Well, I couldn't find the ground, so I pulled the cord anyhow and ended up with a cord in my hands and a parachute billowing over my head, which was the most beautiful sight I'd ever seen. And I could hear the dogs barking and I could hear the whir of the FW-190 as it circled me, and I thought sure that he was going to come and take a shot at me or two. Fortunately, he was a, a pretty good egg and uh, he let me alone and I landed, the parachute collapsed in a tree and I landed on the ground in nowhere, the nowheresville because I didn't know where I was. But in any event, I saw a couple of people standing in the doorway of an old farmhouse, a stone farmhouse. So I went up to them and tried to speak and of course they spoke no English and I spoke no French. By that time, our first pilot and our bombardier came streaming across the field, so now three of us are together. And the three of us hid off into the woods and took off our microphones and our May Wests and tried to bury any gear that we thought would give us away and then took off cross country trying to figure out what to do. We decided we'd try to get out of the Brest Peninsula and head south towards the Pyrenees Mountains. Well, the first night it got started to get cold and we watched a farmhouse for uh, about a half an hour and we saw two men, obviously farmers, coming in and out of the house and we decided to chance it and we went up and knocked on the door and the man invited us in and uh, there's a little old lady sitting there, she had been brewing a kettle of soup over the open fireplace and the fireplace was large with two seats, one on each side of the fire. So we were able, the three of us, to get up into that fireplace and get nice and warm and cozy. The guy opened a bottle of wine and put some soup on, and one of the Frenchmen left. And the other one stayed with us. We couldn't communicate except by sign languages and by saying, yes, we were hungry or thirsty or so forth. But in any event, the man that had left came back in about 20 minutes and led us to another house. And there they put us up for the night and uh, gave us a map and directed us to supposedly a monastery. We slept in a field that night and damn near froze. We tried to light a fire and couldn't get the fire going and finally we just kept walking and we're walking through a town and two figures pop up out of the ditch. Well, we thought sure that they were Germans and that our, the jig was up for us, but as it turns out, it was our flight engineer and the navigator from another ship. So now we're five Americans wandering around the French countryside in broad day daylight, as it turned out. 
finally we ended, come to a little village called Pluré. And as we circumnavigated the town, a little schoolboy was standing in the middle of the road. It turns out we later learned that the kid was heading back for school after lunch. And when he was late for school, the teacher reprimanded him and wanted to know why he had been late. And she said, teacher, I saw five American airmen in the road. Well, she was flabbergasted, and so she turned her class over to another teacher, and she came looking for us. In the meantime, we had been picked up by a wounded Frenchman. He kept us out in the field until it got dark, and then came and brought us back to the schoolhouse in the center of town. And they sheltered five of us for five weeks. But in any event, Tony, the school teacher, knew and had contact with members of the resistance. And after uh, five weeks at the schoolhouse, they split us up and moved two of us to a bistro and two of us to a hotel. And so four weeks later, we got word that we should follow the little Frenchman. And boy, we really ran and we got in a truck and we went to the little town of Gourin and we missed the train. Well, he had to keep us, this chap was the barber in the town of Gourin and he kept us overnight and gave us a haircut and the next day we caught the train and went to the coast, to, to the town of Gangon. And then we stayed two nights in a home there and the uh, a Frenchman in a little gazogen, a charcoal burning uh, truck picked us up and took us to the west, uh, to the northern coast on, in western France where we waited in a farmhouse afterwards became known as La Maison d'Alphonse. And the Maison d'Alphonse was a home owned by Marie and Jean Jacquel on the west coast or the northwest coast of France. And we waited there. We did as we were told. It was a moonless night. We grabbed the coattails of the chap in front of us and we followed about two kilometers from the Maison d'Alphonse to a cliff. There were now 26 of us that are headed in this stream, my Indian file, along the pathway, down the cliff, and we waited on the beach. Now, you, all you could hear was the tide, the, the waves coming in, but uh, after an hour's wait, the coastal defense, German coastal defense batteries opened fire and lit up the coast like daylight, and the big boom of the cannon uh, just scared the daylights out of us. We thought, after all this, that the church is now out. But in any event, the shooting stopped, we waited another hour and a half, and there was a man standing up in the middle of the cliff with a little torch, as the British called it, a little flashlight, and they had various lenses for it. They had a blue lens if everything was okay. They'd put a red lens on if there was danger at the, at the shore. But in any event, shortly, about two in the morning, five little boats came rowing in to the shore and we climbed aboard these little boats and the British sailors boat us out about two kilometers offshore was anchored a British motor gunboat and as MGB 502 of the 15th motor gun gunboat flotilla of the British Royal Navy was a sight to behold and we climbed aboard the, the gunboat and headed off the roar of the diesel engines most comforting and scary because we thought sure it would give us away. We evaded them, got back into Dartmouth, England about uh, uh, daylight, and from there on we were sent to intelligence for interrogating and so on. So that's the story. We were locked up for three days, interrogated by British intelligence, uh, engineering intelligence, Air Force intelligence, uh, infantry intelligence. They wanted to know about the bridges and the uh, fields and the hedgerows and things in Brittany especially. After his interrogation in England in 1944, Lieutenant Patton returned to the United States. Some years later, he became the founder of the Air Force's Escape and Evasion Society.